Olá, estejam todos bem-vindos ao nosso evento. É um prazer estar aqui hoje. Eu estou falando da Fundação Joaquim Nabuco, uma instituição pública em Recife, no Brasil, na qual eu trabalho como pesquisadora. E agradeço a vocês por estarem assistindo a esse seminário hoje. Nós estamos muito agradecidas pela participação dos nossos convidados, não é? por terem aceitado participar nesse debate, eu acho que vai ser uma grande oportunidade para o público, é, no mundo todo, ouvi-los. E, para começar, eu gostaria de agradecer né, a Fundação Joaquim Nabuco, especialmente a Diretoria de Pesquisas Sociais, na pessoa do diretor é, Luiz Henrique Romani, também de toda a sua equipe, especialmente a Adriana Martins. Agradecer especialmente também a, a assessoria de comunicação da Fundação, e a Massangana Multimídia, né? agradecer ao Pedro Coelho, que está nos ajudando aqui é, nesse processo, trabalhando aí no backstage, né? é, e sem os quais seria impossível de realizar esse evento. E dizer inicialmente né, da importância desse evento como parte de um projeto de pesquisa, né, de um projeto amplo que é coordenado por Dalila Oliveira, que tá, é professora da Universidade Federal de Minas Gerais, e está como professora visitante da Universidade Federal da Paraíba, aqui pertinho da gente, aqui na Fundação Joaquim Nabuco, coordenado por mim, e que envolve outras instituições que vão estar participando deste evento, a Universidade Estadual da Bahia, a Universidade Federal de Pelotas, a Universidade Federal Rural de Pernambuco, também a Universidade de Estrasburgo, a Universidade de na França, a Universidade de Barcelona, na Espanha, e a Universidade de Lisboa, em Portugal. Então, é uma rede ampla de pesquisa né, sobre o trabalho docente, sobre a docência na educação básica, em que eu tenho a honra hoje de apresentar esses dois grandes intelectuais né, da nossa área dos estudos educacionais. Então, nós iremos estar aqui hoje com o Luiz Miguel de Carvalho. Luiz Miguel é, está hoje como diretor do Instituto de Educação da Universidade de Lisboa. Ele é um importante teórico que tem escrito muitos artigos sobre as políticas educacionais e sua produção é muito importante nessa área. Ele também trabalha conosco no projeto de pesquisa que eu mencionei anteriormente. Agradecer imensamente a Luiz Miguel por essa participação aqui hoje conosco. E é, agradecer ao nosso conferencista, né, que é uma grande honra, uma grande felicidade apresentá-lo, Thomas Popkevich, como vocês vão ver, que é um importante teórico que influenciou todos nós. Ele é professor né, na Universidade de Wisconsin-Madison, nos Estados Unidos. Ele também tem uma vastíssima produção em diversos livros e artigos, traduzidos para 17 idiomas, entre os quais a língua portuguesa, então tem, muito, tem muitos textos publicados no Brasil, livros, e ele é uma referência nos estudos na área de educação, uma referência muito importante para, para nós. É, o Thomas já esteve aqui na Fundação Joaquim Nabuco, em Recife, e nós agradecemos imensamente por, por estar conosco hoje, então, agora eu passo a palavra para o nosso colega Luiz Miguel, que vai eh, participar desse debate junto com o Thomas Popkevich. Bom dia a todos. Uh, é um prazer estar convosco nesta sessão. Quero começar por agradecer, claro, à Sibel Rodrigues da Fundagem e à Dalila Oliveira, que coordena este projeto de investigação, esta oportunidade para participar neste pequeno encontro com o Tom Popkiewicz. Tom Popkiewicz é, um, é um, um autor, enfim, um amigo, um autor que eu conheço há muitos anos e é, sem dúvida, um dos académicos que tem marcado com o seu pensamento independente e muito inspirador muitas gerações de, de investigadores por todo o mundo. Em Portugal, de certeza, e sobretudo aqui no Instituto de Educação da Universidade de Lisboa, onde, aliás, ele é professor Honoris Causa. Portanto, é um grande prazer que eu tenho de partilhar este, este momento com, convosco e, e, em particular, de poder colocar duas ou três questões que, como perceberão, 
incidem muito sobre um texto que ele apresentou recentemente. I'll start with putting on the screen because um, oh. it's probably the easiest thing for me to do is start and with this. Uh, for a long time, I've been trying to think about science, and lately I've been looking at more particularly how science, at least the sciences we use mostly in education, are involved in what I think of as a comparative reasoning. And that's what I'm going to talk about, how it constructs differences that are about people, but also not about the present, but about the future. And I'm going to focus on PISA. And this is, this particular talk is related in part to something I've been doing with some uh, friends in, in Sweden on looking at PISA as it relates to what's called the Agora. The Agora is the Greek word of the sort of meeting place where the citizens used to go. It's used in science studies to talk about where science enters into society and the state in relationship to policy. And that's generally what we've been doing. And what I'm going to talk about as an illustration of this comparative reason is part of this project that we're doing on the Agora. And um, part of this is also that we take for granted how we that science is about comparing. I mean, if you look at the history of science, it's been about and since modern science is about comparing from the taxonomies of Linnaeus, which goes back even longer, to more contemporary sort of studies about um, sort of the gold standard of, of trying to have comparative groups to understand uh, what works. So I'm going to make four points. And I'll make them now so that if I don't finish, you at least know what I hope to do. First of all, since the 19th century, and I'm not going to talk historically about it, but I can, the social and, science and psychological sciences have been anticipatory. What do I mean by anticipatory? They look at the present as a way of understanding the future. And they have in it desires in the sense of Deleuze and Guattari's notion of desires. And they're also comparative. The second point is that this anticipatory quality, this thing about the future, is about the potentialities of people. In the 19th century, they talked about deviance, and in, in that was a sense of what was normal. And it compared in what was called the social question, which was both in Europe and also in the US, of trying to deal with the effects of modernization and industrialization. And in that, I play with what I call their double gestures. That is the sciences that we use, and I'm gonna focus mostly on education, but I don't have to, I could talk more generally if you want. They have embodied in them this hope of trying to create a better society and a better people. But in that hope of creating a better society and better people, we talk about it in, in liberal theories about the pursuit of happiness is also fears of the dangers and dangerous populations to that hope. And that's embedded in the sciences. I'm not talking about the intent of researchers. I'm talking about the way in which this knowledge configures the way in which we index and compare people. The third point is science or actors. I mean, this is, if you, a lot of contemporary science, a lot of contemporary discussion talks about how we need to think about human and non-human actors. Well, in this sense, I'm talking about knowledge as an actor. It has a material effect. And in some ways, if we want to push this, I'm also challenging the way we think about materialism, which sort of thinks about ideas as sort of there to describe things that enter into the world, and that's the material. And I'm arguing that these sciences, and you could easily illustrate that in education, act to create the world. They create phenomena. And I'm going to use PISA as the last point 
and what I'm going to do as a way of making these three points. All right. Did I use my 20 minutes yet? All right. The first one, it's science is anticipatory <clears throat> and comparative. We take for granted, for example, this idea of development, whether it's instructional development, teacher development, child development. These are anticipatory concepts. They're not about the present. They're about thinking about the present as a way of somehow effecting some future. And schools are places for that. I mean, why do you send someone to a school? You want them to be something different when they come out than when they came in. That's anticipatory. That's in a sense, you're using the present as a way of trying to, to engage in some set of practices that will have something to do with the future. Um, and the thing, and I'll get to this as we go on, this idea of the future and then being, I'm trying to create the future through science is organizing differences and those differences have to do with the interior of the person. When I get to Pisa, you'll see what they're talking about is the well-being of a child. That's the interior. In, in the 19th century, 18th century, they talked about it as the soul and it had all the religious notions to it. Today, we don't use the soul that was in psychology up until the 1920s, and then it became talking about the mind and personality and things like that. But we're still talking about the soul, even though we don't use that religious language. Now, if you look, and this now I'm, I'm directly into sort of um, the literature of Pisa. If you look at Pisa, it continually is talking about a, a desire and hope of the future. And this is just one of their uh, diagrams where they're talking about um, in sort of a, a transcendental history that we had these different revolutions and we're moving up to a future. And the future and the idea is how do you reduce, and you can see that in this point here, the social pain of that future and through incremental change. And so, and these dots are not about the present, you can see it's very explicit once you raise the question, they are talking about the future and transformation to that future and how in their language to reduce the social pain of that. And so the, it, once you begin asking about this question of what is it about? Is it about the present or the future? It's very clear in the way in which it constructs its narrative that it's, it's about some desire that this way of practicing science will be able to affect a better and more prosperous future. That's the gesture of hope. Um, and you can see it in the text. This is from OECD. It is saying it is measuring what will become economic success and harmony and individual well-being. Um, and it's it's assessing at the age of 15 what at the end of their school they'll be able to apply to real life situations, which, and if, again, I'm reading from the text, and equip them for full participation in society. These are not about the present. These are about the future. In the sense, embedded in the, the science of measurement is a notion about what will be are the potentials of people. And this is another quote, I'm not gonna, this is from um, the US, um, from the Educational Testing Service, which is using the PISA material. And they talk about it as human capital, and it's about an inclusive future and well-being of society. Again, these are not about m measures, and I'm gonna also show later that these measures are not about now, they're creating phenomena to think about what is the future. Um, okay, so that's my first point. We're not talking about in science and particularly using PISA about the present. It's measuring things of the present as a way of built upon ideals about what the future. There's a, a historian of science called Lorraine Destin who talks about embedded in facts are also ideals. And we tend not to understand that. 
and we need to understand that the facts we create are not just descriptions. Okay, so now I'm going to talk more about this idea of what is created through the mechanisms, the calculations of PISA are about the potentialities of, PISA, of people and their comparative. And that comparativeness has a double gesture. That is, it excludes and objects in its effort, efforts to include. That is, with the hope of trying to make this future better society through making people, it also constructs differences and differentiations that divides. Again, PISA, in, in the um, paper that I sent, you can, I try to sort of show how these data points are data points which become the reference of, of the real. If I use Deleuze and Guattari, it's, they use the word to deterritorialize and reterritorialize. What does that mean for this? These data points, if you look over on the left, uh, over here, they're about different ways of thinking about how people think and what they do. And then they become re positioned in another space of, of the data itself, this map, this chart. The chart becomes a visual representation of the real. And when you're thinking about whether it's Brazil, whether it's Portugal, whether it's US, whether it's Singapore or Romania, these became become the points of what's real. And so in a sense, what, it, what PISA does, but again, this is not just PISA, it creates a way of relocating what becomes the real as a way of thinking about the problem of who people are and how you change them. And these become then the reference points, the indexes that you begin to say, okay, what do I need to do in Portugal to make my policy better for school? How do I go into the school? And PISA is actually doing that in what's called PISA for you. Um, working with teachers and trying to organize the very way you organize classrooms. Um, and then this, these data points, which become the real, are built upon micro studies of people. But those micro studies of, pe of people get lost. It's not about science even though they talk about science and mathematics and achievement in that, but it's about people. And I'm gonna, at the last point, hopefully I'll get to that, that it has nothing to do with learning science. It has to do here is how you take frameworks of, and they call them literacies, of science and math and assess whether people, children are using them as a way of referencing how they understand their lives. So it's not to understand science, it's, it has to do with the moral order. And again, um, it becomes a GPS system where all of us, by looking at this, can see ourselves on a curvilinear scale, which gives a direction of time, which becomes the memory. And in the paper, which I found interesting, I hadn't thought about before, if you think of each of these points, they become storage spaces about who you are. So all the things that become historically and culturally part of you become reclassified into these as memory. Um, there's a, an interesting book, if anyone's interested, it's called The Beautiful Mind by Oren Halpern, which talks about this construction of memory that is different from our traditional notions of memory. And, um, here you can see that this is, when you talk about PISA, it talks about assessments of science and mathematics. They relate it to what they call quality of life indicators, which is well-being. And you can see that it's, it's not about whether you know science as a practice of, of and first of all, science is really a multiple, as uh, Nora Satina talks about it, is multiple ep epistemic machinery. Biology is different than physics is different from astronomy, but they all become unified, universalized within PISA, and then they're tied to questions of moral order. And you can see that this is qualities of life 
if you, it's not too hard in the imagination, at least for me, um, to think about qualities of life is what the old, the church used to talk about as the soul. Um, but we don't use the, the the religious language; we put it into a secular language. But it is well-being, subjective well-being, work, school well-being down here, balance, and so on. These are all about not about the afterlife, but how do you find the life now that is about the inner sense of the self? All right, I think I'm into the last point. Science is an actor. Now this is, and I wanna to get to the double gestures here and see how I'm doing. How am I doing? I'm okay. Um, this is from the um, evaluation in, that was done. It was a report of OECD on Sweden. And you can begin to see in this that, and visually, and here I'm talking about visual culture, these charts, these graphs become, as I said, storage spaces of memory, but they also become storage spaces of how you tell the truth about things. And you can see in that storage space is the normalization. You can see Sweden at the bottom in highlighted in, um, in a yellow, which makes it below the normal. And by the way, you have to deal with also in understanding this, and I'm not going to talk much about it, probability theory and the Gaussian curve and a whole bunch of other things which are comparative. And you begin to see, though, that there is a comparative reason in this that looks very simple. You're just making a GPS system between and looking at different nations. But that GPS system, if you go back, um, erases differences and then reinscribes those differences in a different way through the way in which you have a cascading set of data like numbers and charts that give an optical, it looks like it has an optical consistency. So when looking at this, Sweden looks the same thing as Hong Kong. It looks the same thing as Liechtenstein. And so it creates this hom homogeneity from which to understand the difference. But that difference is about people. And it's about the inner sense of, the, of who people are. This is again, right from Pisa, where they divide well-being into these different characteristics. And then they say that they're assessing these characteristics, which then tie back into this. And so when you're reading this, you're also reading this. So you're reading the nation, but at the same moment, you're reading about people and kinds of people. And in this is a, a way in which you create an average from which you understand differences through multiple different kinds of calculations. And so the whole problem of comparativeness is about comparing people according to some notion of the average that's built into the probability theory of the, of the, of the measures themselves. And so it is, as I said, it's a soul and the soul is about kinds of people and it's also about what society is. It's not just about people because you can't think about the idea of people without understanding also the social context in which that notion of, of people is made intelligible. Again, this is from the same thing, asking are students satisfied? And they're asking this question, whether you're in Portugal, in Brazil, in China, in Hangzhou, in Hong Kong, or in, um, uh, Vietnam. And so this notion of satisfied, you can see has a certain transcendental category as though it has no location. I use in the paper, I call it the homeless mind. Um, because it appears as it, it really is a universal category that then you can then loop into daily life and say, does this, how does this relate to, and you can see on the bottom, it becomes a way of locating all these different countries. And so this, this way of thinking about satisfied, which has no location, it seems to have no home, all of a sudden is assigned to homes. And so you can look at the uh, at Greece and Qatar, and at the same time, look at the US, which is somewhere over here. Okay. The last point of all of this is that this is all built upon a chimera and what I call well, the Lorelei. The Lorelei is a, is a myth of um, on the Rhine with these uh, maidens singing to sailors 
and they are so entranced by the, the singing, they sail their ships into the rocks along the Rhine. The, the chimera is an illusion, a wonderful illusion that's built upon all sorts of beastly things that um, don't work. And I'm not going to talk about um, these school subjects, mathematics, music, and science, except to say that Pisa is built upon an alchemy. What it does, it takes school knowledge, or what is called school knowledge, which is a translation of what goes on in science into a way of thinking about schools and the, the moral and social development of children. And then they translate it again. So if I, again, if I use Deleuze and Guattari, it's deterritorializing the knowledge of science and math, re-territorializing it into the schools, and then deterritorializing it again and re-territorializing into the metrics. Sounds complicated, but it's a double translation. And when it gets into the school, and this is my, some of you have seen me, I've done this before, but this is the computer science. It gets on a train, travels into a school of education where there are people developing curriculum models. It gets to the teacher and then the teacher teaches this, the, the kid. But when this gets here, it's no longer this. It's something very different. It's this. And I'm, I'm just as one example from Pisa, you can see mathematical thought, and they talk about it as a real world. But if you go back to what I said before, the real world is created by the, the phenomena that's created in the measurement itself. It's not the real world. It's an abstraction of the real world put into data that then becomes the real world. In that way, science becomes an actor because it's creating the phenomena that you begin to see as real as in the object of change. And this is again from, you can see it's preparing students to use mathematics in their personal, civic, and professional lives as part of their construction um, of reflective and engaged citizenship. It has nothing to do with science. It has nothing to do with mathematics. And also to be able to respond later to life. And so again, you can see, or at least I hope you can, this way of thinking about mathematics thinking about what mathematics thought has nothing to do with mathematics. It has to do with the school and it has to do with the way it becomes operationalized through particular apparatus of science in the measurement that creates the phenomena that we begin to think about what's real about children's growth, development, their success, um, and so on in life. Hi, Tom. Great to be with you, even if in this strange situation. <laughs> It, uh, but yeah. anyway, let's do it. Um, I would like to, to participate in your conversation by asking you two or three questions. The first two questions are interconnected, so I will put them together, okay? And then I will go to the, to the last one. Um, the first question concerns a central com concept of your text, the, the concept of comparative reason. Uh, on the one hand, you present it as emerging um, at the interstices of different historical lines, but then, on the other hand, you present it as having a kind of an effect, um, namely uh, an effect organizing a space of action in the Agora. So I, I wonder if you can go a little further on this idea, how is PISA fabricating knowledge and at the same time creating, organizing a space for, for uh, educational debate and uh, educational deliberation. The second question is about one of the arguments that touched me, perhaps one of the most uh, touching arguments you develop here. It's about this idea of comparative reason as embodying uh, double gestures. Uh, as you wrote in, in a recent paper, you said there are hopes and fears that require policy and programs for taking precautionary actions. Would you please develop a little more this concept of double gestures, which may be perhaps a concept less well known by our audience today? Um, so I'll stop here and then I will return 
uh, to a third question related to the nature of social science. The issue of um, the comparative qualities of science have been actually a relatively long one, including the interest probably in the last decade with the double gestures. But when I started thinking about PISA, I realized I, I couldn't get a handle on it. It seems so obvious. That is, those charts that I had. There's a nation next to others people have used, even PISA uses, OECD uses the notion of a GPS. And so already there's a, a notion that it's comparative and we just take it for granted. And I wanted to understand how that notion of comparativeness becomes possible. And for me, it meant starting to think about how different things that are in PISA are brought there, but are not there by themselves. And PISA, which we, it's sort of like looking at a cake. I think I use, I don't know if I use it in the paper or not. It's, you look at a cake and a cake, you, you know, um, you look at the cake and say, oh, that, that looks nice. The cake becomes the object. And you don't really say what's in it. But if you do say what's in it, you see it in relationship to the cake. You say, hmm, the chocolate tastes good, but it's in relationship to the cake. And so when we look at PISA, we think of it as a singular object. And that's the notion of center of calculation. But that center of calculation, and I'll use, again, um, I don't want to make the losing Qatari into icons, but um, the notion of Rhizon, Rhizon, or Foucault talks about a grid. To make PISA into its calculations require a grid of different kinds of practices. And so what I try to do is understand those different practices. Those are the historical lines that I, I play with. Um, to understand how the comparison becomes possible. And then also, and I didn't talk about it very much in the presentation, but it's at the end of the paper more so, and in the paper, um, there are different kinds of comparison that's occurring within PISA. It's not just the same thing. And so that what you see, for example, um, the Swedish government, the Portuguese government, the Brazilian government, all of ours, they see, okay, here's PISA in that report says, Here's what, here, and they have models of here's what you should do. So it looks like a singular object. And, and that object becomes an actor within our social life. And so the idea of understanding these historical lines is understand both how they become possible. And one of the things about PISA, by the way, as I read the, the more technical literature about it, it is considered innovative because of its Bayesian um, statistics and a whole bunch of other things. Um, and so it's just not adding these things together. When they put together, they become something different. We call it PISA, but I wanted to understand what are those things that make it into that calculation, but also how that produces different ways of comparing because it's comparing nations at one level at another level, it's talking about the interior of the child. Um, and there's a whole bunch of other different kinds of nuances to that comparison. It's just not a single notion of comparison. So that's what I was trying to get at. Now, there's something I didn't talk about here. I think I may have mentioned it. We can't assume when that center, and I, the center of calculation to me is a very nice way of thinking about how these different things come together and seen as a singular object that then enters into another space, the agora. I don't, I mean, you can call it what you want. Um, when it enters into that space, it then enters into another set, if you want, of, and gets assembled and connected with a number, number of different practices. I use the language, I think in the paper, it becomes an indigenous 
foreigner. And I should also talk about our affect in a minute, um, but I will. What do I mean by indigenous foreigner? It's really was interesting to me when I started thinking about this, is how do you understand this thing that's produced in Paris that looks like it has no location? It's talking about children's literacy that has nothing to do with anything about my daily life or your daily life. And yet somehow we're able to think that this homeless quality, it has no home, no, no history to it, can somehow resonate with me or resonate with my government or resonate with the media to say, look how well we're doing. Look how awful we're doing. Look, we have to do something. And, and so there's this quality to that apparatus that's just not the science. And then the more you read about the history of science, you realize that there isn't one notion of science, and I'm talking about the social sciences here. <clears throat> but, I mean, just compare f the French versus the American, the empiricism of the American and the sort of philosophical traditions of France. You realize, or you can go to Germany and so on, that there, isn't, there are different cultural principles that enter into these apparatuses that's part of its assembly. And so I wanted to understand these as one of the historical lines is, are these very generalized cultural principles that go in that seem to have a resonance, but then are taken up in different places. And so that's where the piece of becomes this, what I call indigenous foreigner, that is, it has nothing to do with our daily life, but somehow we're able to see it and think it does have something to do with it. But then it enters into another different kind of analysis, which I didn't do. I just wanted to know what's entering in as an actor, not how it, once it gets there, it works. Because it, it works in China, they, I think I mentioned this in the paper, but in China, they say Pisa with a Chinese character. Um, in, in, in a way, it's a nice slogan, but it also has some historical meaning to it. Um, now, part of the social science apparatus and part of the systems thought um, and part of the alchemy, which is what I talk about in the papers, um, part of that is this affect. I mean, there's, what I drew on there, there's a lot of literature primarily that I've read in, um, in cultural geography or human geography, where they're talking about how do you understand the affect of uh, things that are going on that make people emotionally respond to them as though it's something they should do or fight against? And if you read the, the documents of Pisa and some of that affect I, I was in the slideshow was to sort of say they're appealing to a general sense of modernity that seems to have a certain currency in the international world. Um, and that includes places like Singapore and China, and it includes places in North America and in Europe. And so it appeals at this very general level. It's a very, um, actually Antonio Novoa once talked about it, it's, 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 a it's sort of a generalized notion that everyone thinks they know, uh, it has no author, and you could feel that somehow it resonates with your life. And Pisa captures that. Um, and uses it as a way of saying, this is important to you. And, um, and that affect is part of the apparatus. Otherwise, why would you look at a chart of numbers and think that that helps to deal with my own national aspirations and collective desires? And so I was trying to play with that. Now, why the, there was another part, and I, and I hope I'm answering your question, but you can come back and sort of. So two things. One is I use the word intices because, again, these things come together at a certain historical point. They have different historical lines. The affect lines have to do with the enlightenment and other things that have become more generalized. The, the apparatus of science I talk about is a particular historical line that develops in the 1950s 
and you can see how it sort of mutates into the present. Um, if you talk about systems analysis and cybernetics, that's a different historical line. But these things become assembled and connected in a way, and the indices is that point where these different historical lines meet, and PISA becomes the object of that meeting to sort of understand it. The I'll use the word again, uh, not again, but it becomes the empirical object. Not empirical object in the positivist sense, but an empirical object in the sense of saying, how do you understand how it became an object itself? And so that's in a sense what I was trying to do there. Now, why use the language of um, precautionary and preemptive? It's about the future. If I'm right and it's anticipatory, all the things that Fees is recommending is not about the present, but how to make sure you get to the present and prevent things from happening that haven't happened yet. Because they haven't, we're not talking about the present. Um, and so that's why I use the notions precautionary and preemptive. Um, and different people interpret that differently because of where they sort of perceive themselves within some world order and where they see the, you know, their own sort of national imaginaries and so on. The, the notion of double gestures, um, Again, is for me was the minute I, I began thinking about it, it became so empirically evident that that's how things are written. That is, I picked up a, a, a text on adolescence in, in the middle school in the US. And so they would say, the first paragraph would say, the hope is that the kid would have this transition to being an adult and be a wonderful adult and do everything that the child is supposed to do. And the next paragraph says, we have to worry about this adolescent taking drugs, having too much sex, um, being a juvenile delinquent. And you see right in front of your eyes, these double gestures, and they're part of the same phenomena. They're not different. And part of that has to do with, if you want to put it into a, a broader context, the whole notion of um, the notion of a philosophy of representation and the representations take identities and in these identities are also what's not that identity. And so it's also built into a whole different epistemic system that much of modernity is built upon. But it becomes then the, um, there's a book, another book, I keep mentioning books, but I like the title. It's called Cruel, um, Cruel Optimism. That is, it, it, embedded in the way in which we continually have optimism is its impossibilities. And the double gestures is this, that. It's the impossibility of that, because the way in which we reason about things, and reason is not just thinking, it also has a materiality to it. The way we reason about things has built into it, it's opposite that we're trying to somehow get rid of, but it's built into it so it never gets out, never gets out of it. And so the double gesture is a way of trying to understand that the very way we reason about things carries in it its impossibilities because of these double gestures. And again, the minute I pick up a text and try it, and see if I, if I make sense, pick up a text where they're talking about kids and see if, if I'm right, because it's a way of thinking that I, I don't find only in the US. But where you're continually talking about some hope. The, the kid's gonna be a high achiever. The kid's gonna be a good parent. The kid's gonna be a participant in society. You have this, and at the same moment, you have these comparative thinking, which says these are the, these are the things that the kid doesn't have because he's, he's not that. And so it, 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 it's, it, this becomes extremely important in my context because this continually, this talk about, uh, equity um, in a just school. And yet when you talk about equity in a just school, it's built upon the double gestures, which makes it impossible for, the ch for certain children to ever be of the average. And again, that's the double gestures. Um, and it, you need, the double gestures need that affect I talked about before, that notion of salvation themes that, seem, that travel 
in different ways in different places because the, 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 if I use this election here, the salvation themes here are not salvation, but people think they are. And they're different than the ones you would have in, 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 in both in, in uh, Lisbon and also in uh, Brazil. Um, and so the double gestures allows me to play with how the paradoxes of the very way in which we engage in social commitments are undermined by the very way the knowledge acts on us. Again, this idea of science as an actor. Okay, so let me get back on what you're saying, but from perhaps from a, a different angle. For many people, if, well, science is uh, analyzes phenomena, but for others, uh, science is also creates phenomena or creates phenomena. And I think your talk emphasized this idea of science is, science is creating uh, phenomena. And uh, I think the example you use uh, with charts and graphs are really uh, examples very stimulating uh, to understand the ways PISA creates phenomena and that functions at, as a material object. Uh, I don't know if I'm following well your argument, but if I am, what kind of education, what kind of educational realities are these material objects framing? So it's much more about the content of this reality, which is framed by these objects. This requires my going into a whole different other kinds of things. It's a very different, it's, a, it's reframing the complexities of the things we experience into a different set of complexities by which we experience those things. And it tends to be a very particular way of thinking about how one manages life because it's built upon um, particular notions of science. And I'm saying that because there are other notions of science as we all know, especially the social sciences. Um, and, um, but it also is, becomes a way of, of if it becomes a way of totalizing life through this lens, not that it, it's, not that it does, but it, it, it creates that potential of totalizing life within a notion of how you think about life through notions of systems and cybernetics, but also in which the phenomena which we deal become data points. And so, and then, so the, in a sense, it, it, it eliminates a whole range of things that, and this is a whole different kind of issue, but that are no longer considered. And so it seems to me the question becomes, especially in education, how do you uh, bring into education a way of thinking about a range of different ways of experience and understanding the world that allows you to think about its implications and consequences? And this is a, a particular way of narrowing that. And we have to be very sensitive to what that narrowing means. And some of the paper, indirectly gets to that, but it really doesn't talk about that. Um, I don't know if, if that, it's sort of a vague answer because it also requires talking philosophically more about some notion of what education should be, but also what life is about. And, um, but let me say this about science is, is, at least from what I can, from my own stuff and what I read, Science is simultaneously an analyzing and um, creating. And I'll give you some very simple examples. We talk about the child as a learner. That's creating a way of thinking about the child. That's creating phenomena. The child is not, if you pinch the skin of a child, it's not gonna bleed learning. Um, and so, you in a sense created that way of thinking about who the child is. And that enters into the world be and becomes the child which you then analyze. Um, there's a very nice short book by, I mentioned it, it's, it's a, called Against Nature by uh, Lorraine Daston, where she talks about 
how we continually have notions of social order and notions of nature juxtaposed and the different ways of thinking about how these two things uh, work. Um, but she says in that we need to recognize continually that all facts are also ideals. And so this isn't an argument against science, by the way. It's an argument to understand science, but not to get rid of it. Because as I, um, I think I've, I've said this before, I'm very much um, an enlightenment person in the sense, not enlightened, but in the belief of reason and, and science. It's a question of the kinds of sciences we have available to us that I'm interested in. Chegamos ao final da nossa conferência de hoje, agradecendo ao professor Thomas Popkevich pela brilhante exposição, ao Luiz Miguel, nosso colega, por, por esse debate enriquecedor. E convidamos vocês para assistirem às outras às mesas que vão estar nesse mesmo evento, vão estar disponíveis também nos canais do YouTube da Fundação Joaquim Nabuco.